In the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead and start the uh, session, and we'll let people mill in as they get time. My name is Bob Card. I'm president of the Card Group, and a month ago I was the Undersecretary of the Department of Energy, uh, where natural gas was a huge part of what I did there. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be part of the session. I'll be moderating the panel for this afternoon. Uh, which I'm excited to hear about myself. I've been very impressed with the approach and the quality of work of the study. I was asked to say a few things about the importance of this work in my former job to the administration. So I thought I would just make a few comments about where we were with this issue. As you know, natural gas was a huge issue in the administration. I suspect it still is, but you'll have to talk to Mark Maddox at the end of the day to, to learn the current official version of that. Uh, but it was, it was prominent in the uh, national energy policy that the Bush administration put together in May 2001 in two respects, not only natural gas in and of itself, but alternative fuels for dealing with shortages of natural gas, which in 2001, you may recall, we had the first warning of a shortage with a price spike in the spring of that year. In 2002, Secretary Abraham called for the MPC to revise their 1999 study. I was the government co-chair of that study. Many of you contributed to it. And it was a fantastic piece of work that really framed for the administration where we were on natural gas. And so I just thought I would talk to you uh, just for just a couple minutes here about some facts of, of how the government feels about this. The what we observed in international fora was where most nations were counting on natural gas as their climate change bridge into energy. Uh, and so it was a bit frightening in a way to have such uniformity on the international scene of the race to gas, as I think is what I've seen in some of the publications here, and that's what we used inside the Department of Energy too. The MPC study, I think, showed that there were no credible scenarios that didn't have an increase in LNG. Uh, there, there's nothing you could do about an Alaska pipeline plus increased access to domestic resources plus energy conservation that precluded more LNG. And in fact, if you look at the risk factors in the study, they all point to more LNG, not less than was forecast. And I think you're seeing the big energy companies here put their capital where their mouth is, and they're assuming that as well. The <clears throat> LNG, I think the, it's an administ was administration consensus, involved no more safety risk than any other energy commodity. Uh, there was a fair amount of analysis. However, the public perception is not necessarily there. And one thing I learned in office is, is the public treats new things entirely different than they treat old things. And hydrogen was an example when I would talk to people about the hydrogen economy and people worried about hydrogen. I said, if we were already had hydrogen and you tried to convince people to run around with gasoline in their cars, you'd have an outrage on your hands uh, because I'd a lot rather have my children in a car full of hydrogen than gasoline. The, but nonetheless, that's, that's a, an issue that the LNG industry is going to have to work through. There is a strong community of interests uh, within the federal government and the supply chain. Uh, I think I saw more enthusiastic alignment amongst various federal agencies that LNG was a really important thing to do than any other issue while I was in the administration. And so far, I think that's demonstrated with enthusiastic and creative support of LNG by the Coast Guard at Homeland Security, by FERC, Department of Energy, Department of Interior, whoever's involved. But that hasn't resolved the state and local issue. Uh, and it remains an enigma why the communities at the end of the pipe, Southern California, Southern Florida, and New England, who should be demonstrating in the streets to have an LNG terminal, are the most reluctant to host one. Uh, another interesting thing uh, that I would never have guessed is that there is no clear political trigger for natural gas prices. If somebody had told me last December that we were going to have $6 plus prices now and asked what would be happening, I would say everything will be coming unglued. 
But in fact, there's very little, other than rhetoric, there's very little on the ground worry. And it isn't clear to me where the upper bounds of a price threshold for natural gas exist that would actually create substantive political change in the system. By political change, I mean people saying that we should do things that they're not saying we should do now. People with authority to approve things, approving them where they're not approving them now. Uh, so that's, that's been a personal surprise for me on gasoline prices as well. Um, and I think, I think everybody was caught off guard with the patience uh, that has been exhibited. The, uh, and another important thing is I see a lot of producers, not that many consumers here, but the LNG for the U.S. has huge impacts on the people who use it. And my basic scenario is if LNG works, in the U.S., meaning that facilities are permitted when the demand is there and the supply chain works and there's no reason why it shouldn't, and there's no reason why America shouldn't have three to four dollar Henry Hub gas as far as the eye can see. But if it doesn't work, meaning that the terminal turndowns that are occurring already persist, that there's terrorism or other threats that deny entry into the U.S., short term or long term, then we're clearly looking at a six to nine dollar or greater energy future. Natural gas will not be particularly competitive, and those who've invested in a natural gas infrastructure will be underwater, and coal and nuclear and other alternatives will be flush. So if you're an energy systems buyer, an electric utility, an LDC, or somebody else who's making even bigger investments than the LNG supply chain is, and, the, and your postulated outcome, this is a very difficult time uh, because I, can, I could easily see political scenarios that would deny entry of LNG in the quantities needed into the U.S. and generate those high price bans. So I think the, the work of this study is extremely important because of the effect of natural gas on everything else that we do. With that, I'm going to turn over to the program, and our first speaker is going to be David Victor again. And since this is a repeat performance, I won't bother introducing him, just to say that uh, in my own review of David's work, he's done some pretty interesting work even outside of gas and other areas uh, such as climate change and, and whatnot. And, and I think his experience on the Council of Foreign Relations obviously shows through in his work here. So. Uh, I told David my, one of my greatest disappointments is I didn't learn of him earlier in my service in the administration. David, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, thanks to all of you for uh, coming back for the beginning of what will be four panels uh, over the course of the next um, day and a half looking at some of the major themes coming out of the, both the case study work and the model that's been developed here at Rice. Let me just say a brief word about um, the uh, session A here. We, you're going to see uh, this afternoon in this session uh, two case studies. The one I'm going to talk about, which is a pipeline uh, from Russia into the German market principally. Another one, uh, uh, James Ball is going to talk about the Trinidad uh, LNG project. And then you're going to hear from the modeling team about um, what some of the possible future projects may be, at least when you look at the economics of this. We wanted to start with this subject because the question of who is going to build this infrastructure and put out the trillions of dollars that, that are implied over the next 30 years is one of the central questions in this industry right now. So we have to get a sense historically who's done what in the past and why and what do we think this changing structure of the gas market might imply for the for the future. I'm going to speak today about a study that, that is a joint product of myself and uh, Nadezhda, who is my close collaborator uh, on a number of studies we've done now on the Russian oil uh, business and now on, on the Russian gas business. Let me just start uh, with a basic overview of the project that we're looking at here. This is a, in some sense, this is a Russian view of Europe. So you've got Russia right here in the middle. Uh, here, are the, here are the European markets, the German market, the Italian market. Here's Poland here, Belarus, and Ukraine down here. As everybody knows, there was a very large number of huge pipeline projects built starting in the late 1960s through the 1980s to take Russian gas into the German, the French, the Italian market, and a few other markets as well. Those projects, and they were built as state-to-state -state agreements, essentially state-to-state -state agreements, organized by the Soviet Union, 
are shown with these very large pipelines here that all go through uh, Ukraine. Now, the dominance of Ukraine in this market in part reflects uh, terrain and in part reflects that the Russian gas industry initially built up around fields here and some in the Caucasus and the network organized around some of those early fields. And as those fields were depleted, Russian gas production moved east into western Siberia. And the paper has some more detail about that and some quantitative detail about that. So the system bequeathed by the Soviet Union was essentially this huge backbone of large, you know, one 56-inch pipe after another right next to each other, a gigantic system that moved a very large amount of gas, actually principally for consumption inside the Soviet Union and also for export. Uh, I'm going to be speaking today about the largest, Russia being the largest holder of proved reserves, the largest producer in the world, and the largest exporter. And I'm going to skip over, I apologize, a couple of the details in the 20 minutes that I have to, to, to talk about this project. The project that we are looking at here is not one of these huge state-to-state -state pipeline projects, because although those are really interesting historically, you don't actually learn very much about the today's world by studying those projects because those are not the kinds of projects, we argue, that are going to be going forward in the future. Instead, what we're doing is we're looking at a pipeline right here that connects to an existing pipeline that was built as part of the earlier era, this yellow pipe here. We're looking at this blue, I think that's blue, yeah, blue pipe here that's, that starts in Belarus and crosses uh, Poland and goes into the northeastern German uh, market. And I'll say a couple words in a moment about why this pipe was built and what folks were trying to do. Something to underscore is that this pipe does not cross Ukrainian territory. This is a really interesting study for us because this allows us to look at the transit country problem. You had an integrated country, the Soviet Union, no transit country problems there, and then suddenly because of political change inside the Soviet Union, these transit countries appeared, and we've been able then to look as almost like a controlled scientific experiment. Social scientists rarely get this, so it makes us very excited. A controlled scientific experiment to look at the consequences of transit country uh, issues. And that's what we're looking at here. Don't worry about the detail in here, but this slide here shows the history by offtaker of Soviet and then Russian gas exports. And what I want to underscore is simply, if you look way up here on the top, that's 1970, that's the, the first pipeline that, that leaves the Soviet Union, a uh, significant pipeline that leaves the Soviet Union initially to supply uh, a small market in Poland, but mainly Austria and Czechoslovakia. And then over time, with new projects, you have more countries coming online and larger and larger supply. The, the size of the pies is proportional to the size of the volume, so that today we're looking at about 130 BCM uh, of exports. Now, what we do in this study is we try to unpack who did what in building this pipeline, which we call the Belarus Connector. Uh, let me just, as a historical point, back on this map, a lot of the literature calls this pipeline that we're studying, this pipeline that goes across uh, uh, Belarus and into the German market, a lot of it calls it the Yamal pipeline. And that's because in the early days, the interests on the Russian side were to tap these gigantic fields in Yamal, on the Yamal Peninsula, those fields right up here. And so whenever somebody wanted to do an export project, folks with crayons and maps would start drawing lines, and they always started a Yamal and then they cruise across territory and then go into the market that they were interested in serving. And so the name stuck that this is the Yamal Europe pipeline. In fact, it has really nothing to do with Yamal whatsoever. And so we call it the Belarus connector because we wanted to underscore in this, or at least examine in this study, whether and how the effort to go around Ukraine and instead use Belarus as the transit country in fact affected the outcomes. That's the, the as social scientists, that's the problem we're trying, as historians, that's the problem we're trying to look at. So who did what and why? Let me just try and break this down in a very stark way. First, why are Russia and Gazprom interested in this project at all? You have to rewind the tape of history back to the late 1980s and the early 1990s and imagine that there's incredible chaos inside uh, the Soviet Union and the organization of the gas sector in the Soviet Union. The problem that they faced was how do they continue their volume-oriented strategy. You'll hear tomorrow a study by Mark Hayes about the Algerian exports into, uh, into Italy, and the Algerian strategy was, was not only a volume strategy, but also a price-based strategy. The, 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 the Soviet and Russian strategy has been basically to boost volumes as much as possible. 
to make Russia a reliable supplier of ever larger volumes. And so the, the, the organizational problem that arrives from the Soviet gas ministry, then eventually what we now today call Gazprom, that organizational problem is how do we build new pipelines in order to expand our exports? But they have an additional problem, which is that they're selling gas in the German market, which is the single most important West European market for them. They're selling gas through Ruhr gas. And they have some sense of what the margins are. And they say, hey, all those margins shouldn't be going to Ruhr gas. We want to somehow try and get around Ruhr gas and get more of those margins for ourselves. And so they have this twin strategy. They're interested in boosting volumes, and they're also interested in increasing margins for themselves uh, at the, at the uh, expense of uh, at the expense of rural gas. The argument we make in this paper is that first and foremost, this is a commercial deal. Whether or not they actually realize these ambitions is another question, but that's what they thought they were doing. A lesser part of this deal has to do with the transit countries, and in particular, the role of Belarus as a transit point. By the middle 1990s, it is painfully clear to Gazprom and to the Russian government that Ukraine is not the most reliable transit country imaginable on the planet. Um, they had had a couple of interruptions. Uh, they had enormous difficulties in getting, the, uh, getting payment uh, by Ukraine of the gas that Ukraine either um, took by agreement or otherwise. And Belarus was seen as basically part of the Soviet Union, more or less. And so that was a reliable transit country, and we don't need to worry about the Belarusians causing us trouble. That's part of what's going on here, but I think basically what's happening is that this is a commercial strategy. Uh, in the case of uh, Poland, the pipeline, for geographical reasons, has to cross Poland. It's an interesting market for the Russians because Poland doesn't have much gas in its market at all. It's a coal-dominated system, and they think along the way we can also sell enormous volumes of gas to Poland. But the main prize here is the German market. There is no German interest here. There, it, the idea that there's a German state strategy is, doesn't apply, and I think it, as a general rule, doesn't apply to most uh, democratic countries. But there is no German interest here. Instead, what's going on is you have an effort inside the German gas market driven by one company, Wintershall, which is part of BASF, the single largest user of gas in the German market, to get around rural gas as well. And nobody will sell them gas except for Gazprom. And that's how the deal gets put together. Gazprom originally envisions this as tapping the Yamal fields and building huge pipelines, doing the same thing that everybody did during the Soviet Union, uh, which would have been a 20 to $40 billion project. Nobody's going to finance a 20 to $40 billion project on a completely speculative Polish market for an effort to go around the state monopoly in Germany. So what happens is this project gets scaled back, progressively scaled back. And in essence, each party in this deal unilaterally decides what size project and how many compressors and where are going to be, will correspond with their interests. And that's, I think, the, the driving commercial a aspect of this, of this project. Let me just show a couple slides to give you a sense of what the consequences were of this, uh, of this project, and then I'll, then I'll close up. This first slide here is a little bit complicated, but the, but the message, I think, is very important. What you see on the horizontal axis are exports from the former Soviet Union up until 1990, and then Russia after 1990. And the vertical axis that you see is the price, the gas price, um, measured in two different units. They're all in 1996 dollars uh, per cubic meter on the left uh, side, and on the right side, uh, the, the price per, per million BTU. Um, we have had, as you can imagine, a really nasty time figuring out what the real price of gas is inside the Soviet Union and Russia. And I just, just let me posit that we did a good job on that, and we're not perfect. Um, what, what you see on the top line here is the price if you use the Western prices, which of course is not what's hap not all the gas trades at Western prices, because a lot of the gas is trading to countries that still have the old pricing regime. What you hear, see here on the lighter line at the bottom is our best effort to figure out what the real pricing regime is. And when we tally up the total value, which uh, in recent years has been on the order of $20 billion, approaching the revenues that come from oil exports, when you tally all that up, you get to something that's close to what the, the, the Russian government actually reports as revenues. And I'm not yet willing to concede that the reason we're not exactly on what the Russian government reports as revenues is because we did the pricing scheme wrong. Um, what I want to underscore is that the, on the Russian side of this deal, 
You, first of all, you see when the Soviet Union breaks up, you see a huge increase in volumes, which is completely an accounting artifact. It's simply because a lot of trade that used to be internal to the country is now, for example, exports from Russia to Ukraine, which is now an international trade. And then you see this increase in volume that's about 20 BCM uh, during the 1990s. And that largely, but not completely, that largely is due to the efforts, this volume strategy connected to this, uh, this pipeline. How well did Gazprom do in meeting its initial commercial ambitions in this project? Um, we've spent a lot of time working on this, and let me just summarize it briefly, which is our assessment is that the effect on margins was minimal. That, they, that Gazprom sold more gas into the German market, but arguably it was a long baseline. If they hadn't been messing around with Winters Hall, they probably would have sold roughly the same increase in volumes uh, to Ruhr gas and to whatever came out of the Treuhand efforts in eastern Germany. So it was largely, we think, along the baseline. It is probably the case, um, we use this word gas on gas competition uh, uh, haltingly, but it is probably the case that the willingness by Gazprom to sell gas to Wintershall helped accelerate a little bit more of a competitive gas market in Germany than would have been the other than, than would have occurred otherwise. That's the argument that we made in the in the paper, and that's part of the reason why they never saw this increase in margins that they were that they were so much hoping for. Because what happened is that the margins got squeezed, and and um, uh, Gazprom didn't get those additional margins. Um, I think disaster may be too strong of a word, and, uh, but it has not unfolded as Gazprom had, had expected. But let me caution that there's one part of this story that is still unfolding that is arguably the most important thing to watch about Russia and the European gas market, which is that part of Gazprom's strategy here has been to take stakes in a whole set of downstream gas distributors and, ga and players in the European gas market. Stakes that allow Gazprom to get information about marketing and information about trading and so on. And if you think that the European gas market is uh, unfolding into a more competitive world and you're worried about uh, the exercise of market power, then this potentially is a keystone in that strategy on Gazprom's side to, to exercise market power in the European market. I don't think we see that yet. But that's because we're just, this market is still just unfolding. And the, what we need to be really worried about is whether and how antitrust regulation would actually be able to identify these kinds of activities and, uh, and, and regulate them. That's a question about the future and the future of the European gas market that I won't go into here. Let me say a word about what's happened in the German gas market. It is, I think, certainly the case that the margins at Ruhr gas have been eroded, as you would expect, as any system moves from a complete monopoly to something that has a little bit of a of, of competition in it. Wintershall's share in the market has risen over time, and they probably would, would have had a hard time doing that had they not had Gazprom as their, as their um, launch supplier, as it were. Um, and the German consumer has is, is, is arguably been the, the bigger winner in this uh, rather than, than the, um, than the uh, marketers. Let me say a word in passing about Poland. Poland is not the centerpiece of this project. This project is designed, first and foremost, to go to the German market, the northeastern German market, and to try and do things that, we, that I've just been talking about in the German market. But Poland's an interesting case along the way because you have lots of gas crossing the country, and you have, at the time, enormous interest in selling higher volumes into the Polish uh, gas market. If you, this slide just shows total primary energy measured we used to measure total primary energy in tons coal equivalent in a coal-dominated society, and then we were using tons oil equivalent in BP statistics, and now in the gas world we'll be, we'll be using BCM equivalent. So this is showing uh, primary energy in, in BCM equivalent. There's coal measured in BCM, which I think is fun. Uh, there's oil, and here's natural gas. And what you see is a very, very small role for natural gas in the, in the Polish market over time and not a dramatic increase in the role of gas in the Polish market, um, uh, even as you see the beginnings of liberalization in that, uh, in that market. And I think what's going on here is a pretty simple story, that coal is fighting back, that you have extremely well-organized miners, you have an extremely reasonably well-organized electric power sector. It's not obvious that even meeting the new environmental rules for the European Union, that that involves shutting down all these coal plants and switching instantly over to gas and so on. This, I think, this, these stories, and you'll see a few others over the next day and a half, are cautionary notes about the assumption that automatically gas is, is necessarily the winner 
uh, in these markets as, as, the, as gas supplies become, uh, become available. Let me just make a brief uh, and I think very interesting com uh, contrasting point, which is contrast the role of gas in the Polish market with, uh, with the Soviet Union, where Khrushchev basically in the 50s took off his shoe and hit the podium and said, thou shalt use gas, and people started building gas distribution systems and tapping much the, the, the state direction uh, in favor of gas explains a lot of the rapid shift uh, to gas in the Soviet Union, to the point where it, it approaches about 35 percent of total primary energy in the peak years in the late, uh, late 1980s. Let me briefly say that we have downplayed the importance of bypass around Ukraine as the, as the central reason for why this project went forward. Instead, we argue that this project went forward because all the parties who were going to be involved in financing this thing could scale the size of the project to meet their expectations and their commercial strategies, and that the, the Ukrainian problem was not anywhere near as, as severe as folks have made, it, have made it out to be. On this slide here, you see that, that there not, this is not the only option for moving around Ukraine. Uh, it's the most interesting option for moving around Ukraine but there's also the Blue Stream project, which goes directly from Russian territory into the Turkish market. And then there's another project that's being considered right now, the North Transgas project, which would go along the Baltic Sea uh, and access European markets directly. And I won't get into that uh, here in any more detail. We've spent some time in the paper looking at that. Let me close by drawing out two, possibly three main implications for geopolitics. The first one, and I think this is why it's so important, and we've learned so much and through our collaboration with our colleagues here at, at, at Rice, who are principally economists, is that the, the key points about geopolitics, I think, are first and foremost, as we move into this more market-oriented world, are first and foremost issues related to, to geoeconomics and which kinds of projects uh, uh, go forward on the basic economic grounds. This study and some others that you'll see underscores that we need to pay really close attention to the estimation of demand, that in the case of Poland and in the case of Turkey, serviced by the Blue Stream Project, in both cases I think folks dramatically overestimated the potential demand for gas uh, and found that their projects ran into commercial trouble because of errors on the demand side, not just on the construction of pipelines and upstream uh, exploration and development. We argue that the transit country problem has been uh, maybe not ephemeral, but it's been largely overstated because over the long term, these markets are, are in some fundamental sense contestable. And in the world of high capital intensity, um, once something's bolted to the ground, the incentives are really, really strong to keep the gas moving through it and find some way to work through uh, contractual difficulties and so on. Our, we think that era of the big 56-inch pipes, one right after another, is long gone now, and these kinds of projects, which this is really the only one coming out of Russia right now, these projects with smaller pipes, smaller volumes, scalable and so on, are the way that, that this new, more commercially sensitive world is going to be headed. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next, we're going to hear from Peter Hartley, who's chairman of the economics department here at Rice on the world gas trade model. Peter? Thank you very much and uh, appreciate very much the opportunity to talk to you about the work we've been doing at Rice and uh, on this model and uh, what we intend to do going forward. Um, the genesis uh, from our perspective of, of uh, this uh, World Trade Gas model actually grew out of the project we had started uh, with the Japanese looking at Sakhalin natural gas, the use of Sakhalin uh, natural gas. Uh, and was discussed earlier this morning the, the options of the pipeline versus the LNG. And uh, one thing that became evident when we were looking at that uh, project was that uh, these two alternatives were very competitive. And we got to thinking about um, what might happen uh, gi given the, and one reason why they were competitive was because there'd been big changes in uh, the costs of LNG uh, shipping. And uh, that got us thinking about uh, the, what the consequences of those big changes in the costs of LNG would be for, for um, the gas market and got us thinking about a world gas market. Um, then uh, uh, we were sort of, I'll repay a little bit, um, uh, well, David's compliment saying he had some advantage working with economists. One advantage we had was uh, we were thinking about trying to make our model, which I'll, I'll say a little bit about, 
uh, a bit more practical by actually building in facts about where gas is located, where the demand is and so on, when the Stanford group uh, suggested this uh, geopolitics study. And the uh, advantage of that from our perspective as economists is that uh, we wanted to build in from the start this ability to look at a lot of political factors, the effect of political factors on the gas market. Uh, and so that led us into a model, modelling framework which is very flexible. We wanted to be very flexible so we could, we could uh, override a lot of the economic factors and look at the consequences. So that's uh, um, uh, basically the genesis of, of the sort of modelling framework we've got. The spirit of this model is indeed uh, we view it more as a, a, a means for doing lots of sort of experiments, thinking about the consequences of uh, various uh, factors that would influence the market and uh, trying to trace those through. Uh, what's the, the uh, basis behind the model? Well, basically, uh, the model uh, tries to capture these uh, key facts. First of all, as many speakers have emphasised so far today, the world supply, the potential, is very, very large, but a lot of the um, potential supply is concentrated in areas that are remote from markets, areas that don't have a lot of infrastructure, and, uh, and also in areas that uh, may not be politically stable, and that's where a lot of the political factors are, are important. On the other side of the market, the potential for demand growth also is very large, and we've, we've heard a little bit about a lot of the factors that have uh, led to the growth in demand for gas. Uh, what we wanted our model to do was to be based on, first of all, looking at what the economics implies about how the gas is going to be, where it's going to be developed, where it's going to be used, how it's going to be shipped, and then talk about or use the model to, over, to analyze some of these uh, factors that may override uh, the economic considerations. Uh, with those things in mind, uh, we looked around. We're very fortunate in having Ken Medlock uh, join the Baker Institute soon after we got going on this. And Ken came from uh, the NPC study uh, where they had used a market builder uh, model to model uh, these kinds of markets. And it seemed to be very well suited for our purpose. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, what the project has done is sort of moved on from the work Ken was doing at NPC, extended that on the world basis. Ken is going to speak to you, speak to you tomorrow uh, about uh, a couple of the experiments. So I'll give you a flavour for how you can use this model to do these experiments I talked about. Uh, and so you'll hear, hear from him tomorrow morning on, on some of those. Uh, what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about what we call in the base case uh, and is going to give you sort of a flavour for uh, what the economics are saying given, given our um, assumptions about uh, where the supply, potential supply is, how demand's going to grow, uh, and the various costs involved in both exploiting resources and developing the transport links. Give you the, a feel for what the model implies about how the world's going to look over the next few decades. Uh, the economic model that we use is a dynamic spatial equilibrium model. So it's spatial in the sense we have, so we have these different areas of supply, different areas of demand, we want to connect them up. But it's also important that the model is uh, what we, this intertemporal aspect that's linked over time. And uh, so what that means is that producers can decide when to bring resources online. And that decision is based on expectations about what's going to happen to the price path over the horizon that, that you're looking at. And so what the model has to do is solve for the likely path of prices at the same time that it's solving for bringing on the capacity and bringing on the transport links. And uh, an implication of this kind of model is that as you build these links, on the one hand you transport gas in one direction, what happens is the prices move in the opposite direction. So if you take gas to a high price market, it tends to bring a high price back to, to where the gas is flowing from. Similarly, if and it producers anticipate prices are going to go up, they will have an incentive to delay bringing on the capacity, to take advantage of the higher prices that they anticipate in the future. Also, they have an incentive to bring forward projects from beyond that period back to an earlier period. Both of those things tend to lower the price. So that's how you get this, this uh, arbitrage of prices through time as well as across locations. Okay, um, I go through this rather quickly, I guess, because everyone's been talking about this, this sort of uh, factor. So. Uh, as I mentioned, there have been uh, there are a number of reasons why the demand for gas 
uh, natural gas has, has been growing. Uh, important one is, is the environmental regulations, but another one is the deregulation of electricity markets. So one of the consequences of the deregulation of electricity markets, particularly dereg uh, de deregulatory systems that have promoted competition, is that one can show that in a more competitive environment you want to bring on capacity more frequently but a smaller scale. And that's something that advantages uh, gas, particularly combined cycle gas turbine, relative to, to coal. Uh, and then, uh, uh, of course, there's also been technological change. Partly that's uh, correlated with this. The demand for lower capacity plants has encouraged people to invest in that kind of technology. So we've had this development of the gas technology. And then uh, economic and population growth increases the demand for energy, but also particularly the demand for gas because of the uh, environmental, this is called the environmental Kuznets curve. As people get wealthier, one thing they demand is more environmental quality. Uh, one thing we're going to do with the model is we also want to look at some of the people. So uh, David emphasized um, this idea that there could be potential uh, hazards associated with this big growth in the demand for gas. Uh, one thing that may be a positive factor is that it's possible that the, let's see if I can figure out where this goes. Mine's going a bit flat, I guess. <laughs> so you push that one. Okay. So one thing that could increase the demand for gas is, is possibly use in transport fuels. One thing that things that could work in the opposite direction are alternatives for producing electricity. And two in particular that we've been interested in here or at, at Rice are the uh, use of potential development of solar technology and coal gasification. Another one is high, development of high voltage direct current transmission, which would be an alternative to transporting gas. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, part of the origin of this project was the idea that we're going to develop a new kind of market, uh, which is going to involve uh, much more uh, spot market trades of gas, more uh, liquid market for gas, uh, and that's going to um, uh, lead to this, this change in structure. And the point of our previous analysis was that the expectation of a, a new market structure can actually itself tend to uh, stimulate the development of that alternative. Uh, in the model that I've talked about, we um, have estimated uh, demand based using uh, data from the IEA. Uh, we looked at, related the demand for energy, first of all, uh, to the level of economic activity, the, the population growth, and the level of economic development. And the key idea is that there's a non-linear relationship between uh, economic growth and the demand for energy. This is something that Ken and um, Professor Saligo, who's also done some work for this um, study on uh, the possibility of a gas OPEC, have worked on. And basically the idea is that as the economy develops, as measured here by per capita GDP, uh, the extra growth in GDP leads to uh, less than proportionate increase in uh, demand for energy. Um, and then uh, on top of that, we have a similar kind of equation that relates the demand for uh, gas, in particular relative to alternative fuels, to changes in the relative prices, and again, the level of economic development. And uh, uh, putting those things together, you get the demand on the demand side of the model. Of course, to, to use that to forecast, you have to forecast economic growth, you have to forecast prices, you have to forecast population growth. We're not modeling all those things. We, get, we take the forecasts of uh, those things from others and combine them with the demand forecasts. Uh, on the supply side, you've seen this picture before, uh, the major supply sources. Another way of looking at it in terms of numbers. So um, uh, here we have uh, proved natural gas reserves by region in uh, 2003. There's the numbers in the little boxes. And uh, below that we have undiscovered natural gas. And what we actually use in our model in terms of supply is we have the regional resource potential, uh, the median level of the resource potential, resource estimates that come from the world resource assessment of the USGS which includes associated and unassociated natural gas resources, both conventional and unconventional gas deposits in North America, but not outside of North America, and conventional gas deposits in the rest of the world. And the resources divided into three categories proved growth in the known and undiscovered. And all of this work is based on a model the USGS has developed about how given uh, geological structures, 
uh, probabilistically were related to uh, future resource potential. And uh, going along with this um, database uh, developed by the USGS and Altos, uh, resource cost estimates, the cost of developing uh, the given uh, resources in the different regions. Uh, and then what the model does is it brings on these supplies uh, dependent on the, the assessment of the, the cost of exploitation, uh, but also the current and expected future prices, net of transport costs, net, netting back, subtracting out the transport costs for getting the resource to market. Uh, the total available resources will also influence uh, how the resources are exploited. The capital cost of development, uh, as well as the operating and maintenance costs, uh, and these production profiles by region that I mentioned. We also have in the model the ability to influence tax rates, required rates of return, and other economic parameters, which would give us a lot of flexibility for looking at different kinds of policies. Uh, and then the model similarly determines new transportation links uh, based on capital costs and operating and maintenance costs. And of course, an implication of the model is that supplies earning the greatest rents are going to be extracted first. So here's an example of uh, some of these uh, supply curves for a number of regions. And given the remarks that were made this morning about Qatar, we're going to have to revisit this one, I think. <laughs> but, uh, but here's an example. So, so we have, um, uh, this is, um, so the green one is North Alaska, Qatar. This one is uh, Saudi Arabia. And this is uh, Western Siberia. And you can just see what this picture implies is an enormous resource potential in Western Siberia, and that comes through in the model. Now, uh, as we work with the model, things like the, the, that our example, the model is going to tell us how we think the resources are going to be developed. We can compare that with what we think should happen, and in that way we sort of uh, work on the model iteratively. So this is always a, a work in progress. Uh, as, as we develop results, we go back and, and look. Uh, that's the supply side. The next thing is the transport links. So uh, what you do with these transport links, we got, Ken's got all these maps up in his office of all the different pipeline networks. You sit down and try to aggregate these pipeline. Uh, well, first of all, you aggregate the demand. So for example, Germany, you split the total demand in Germany we did into three different regions. Aggregate the demand into three nodes. Imagine it's concentrated at three major points. And some, similarly with some of the other larger countries like France and so on, we have uh, multiple demand nodes. And then you also aggregate the pipeline capacities. So the parallel pipes, you imagine, is just sort of one link. Uh, aggregate the pipelines connecting the major supply regions and the demand regions. So you've got to discretize the, the uh, demand and supply system uh, and in order to get a feasible set of uh, a feasible model that you can work with. As it is, this one takes several days to solve. Um, so I mentioned all this. Uh, when it comes to LNG, um, also we want to have a model which is flexible enough to lay, accommodate different kinds of, of uh, routes for getting the, the, the LNG to market. So one way we do that is we use a hub and spoke system. So what this means is that, is that getting from this hub to these different regions here is not so dependent on whether a particular project in the supplier country goes ahead. There are a number of different ways of getting gas here so that if any one of these uh, supply projects doesn't, doesn't uh, get going, you still may be able to get gas from this hub to the demand node. See, this way, you, you, by representing the, the system as a hub and spoke system in this way, rather than a series of bilateral trades, uh, it's much more flexible less and, and less contingent on a particular project going ahead. Uh, the physical analog of, of, of that would really be that, that uh, if someone can't fulfill a contract because they don't have the supply, essentially they can arrange a swap some sort of swap agreement, so they can still fulfill the terms of the contract. Uh, now, we need to, to have estimates of the costs, so uh, we use, also use some econometrics to, to get uh, estimates of the pipeline costs. So using data on 52 different projects, we related the costs of those projects to the length of the pipe, whether it crossed mountains, whether it crossed ocean, uh, and whether it was going through more populous areas, and uh, also the capacity of the link. And from that, we get a, a sort of an, a, an equation that relates the cost of a pipeline to uh, the various characteristics of that, that pipeline route. And we use that to, to get these um, cost estimates for putting in new pipes in new parts of the, the world. For LNG costs, uh, we didn't have quite the same database. We consulted a variety of sources. 
uh, and that led us to a number of cost estimates. I don't want to go into detail here, but we have a table of, of some of the cost estimates. And I guess our latest information is uh, that, that possibly we've overestimated the shipping part of this, but uh, we think that the, um, these costs seem to be in the ballpark of the sort of numbers that people have talked about. And we've gone back as the boards with a lot of people in the industry uh, about that. Now, some of these proposed LNG routes don't go ahead in the model, and some do. Okay, so let's uh, talk about some of the base uh, results. So uh, putting the model together, one thing you see here is the price projection, uh, uh, dollars per MBTU, and uh, here's the range of prices for uh, key locations. And you can see much as time goes on, this range of prices is decreasing. This is where this world mark is developing. Uh, part of the wiggles in these prices come about because of these new projects coming on. Because if you bring on these new projects that have to come on in discrete increments. So if you build a big new pipeline, uh, that can lower prices temporarily. Uh, and then they, they increase again, and then the next increment of capacity comes on. So even though in the model there's this incentive to arbitrage through time, uh, the offset to that is that you've got to bring on the capacity in discrete units. Uh, Ken's going to show you some more uh, examples tomorrow of uh, some, some alternative, some alternative uh, scenarios. Uh, here's what happens, the model says about supply in, as it is in 2002, 2020, 2040. And you'll see this green here is uh, Russian supply stays about the same percentage, but of course the overall market is growing phenomenally throughout this period. And an interesting thing that happens in this, this world is uh, that in the end, in fact, uh, Russia ends up building a pipeline that connects its uh, west and east. And so we end up having, uh, so initially, gas is supplied to China from uh, east Siberia, and then as those reserves start to decline, the model wants to connect in West Siberia with a new pipeline. And so you end up with Russia being in the business of selling gas by pipeline East and West and by LNG. So it ends up being a, a key uh, arbitrage point within the whole system. Um, the, uh, the United States is in this red, and you can see its share really declines uh, as the U.S. deposits get uh, depleted. And then the other interesting thing in this is the Middle East grows, particularly at the end of our forecast period. So the Middle Eastern region uh, really increases its share. Uh, another interesting one is the purple uh, here, Latin America, something which I'll say something about in a minute. Uh, in fact, Latin America, you end up not having such a large export because the yellow is, this is the demand shares, and the point is that the, the demand within Latin America also grows a lot. Uh, and you can also see here uh, the biggest demand is, is the U.S. again now is the green. And so its share, though, actually as a percentage of world demand declines, that reflects the fact that we've got this nonlinear relationship between the level of economic development and, uh, and the demand for gas. So as these other countries develop, that accelerates the demand for gas faster than as the mature economies uh, develop. So the share of the U.S and Western Europe and overall world demand actually declines um, over time. Here's what happens to LNG in this world. So uh, we have a big increase, and Amy showed you uh, this picture earlier uh, this morning, uh, the big increase, big growth in LNG coming from the Middle East here at the tail end of the forecast period. Uh, and um, then the, finally, I have two pictures, one of uh, major exporters, uh, here the, the big exporter is Russia, so this is uh, Russian exports. This is all done as a share of world demand. Actually, one thing this picture shows overall is that there's much more trading as the world develops here. We have much, much more trading of gas, so exports become a much bigger share of overall world demand as, as, the, um, as, the time, as time progresses. But then also, uh, well, the Russian share goes up a little bit, but again, you have coming in here Saudi Arabia and, and some of the... Um, uh, uh, Middle East. Another big one is Iran. Interestingly, in this model, uh, what the model says that Iran should do is export uh, natural gas to India via pipeline. And so the big growth in, in Iranian exports here is via pipeline to India. And finally, um, uh, that was the export side. The import side, here are some of the key countries that are importing according to the model as we, as we progress through time. So uh, again, the green is the U.S., so uh, imports less than 20%, 2002. So 
but uh, they rise closer to 40%, the end, end of the uh, horizon. Uh, yellow and red here are China and India. Uh, the, the bronze uh, or brown bar is Mexico. The Mexico is actually exporting down here, uh, but then becomes a very big import in terms of its percentage of gas that's met from, from imports. Um, as I say, uh, the key point of this model is not so much to say this is what's going to happen. The key point is, is that it's a framework for us to do a lot of these experiments. We're thinking about what's going to happen. We're going to change. So one thing Ken's going to talk about tomorrow is two of these experiments. One where we change the costs of LNG, another one where we, we um, increase the required rate of return on projects in Russia. That's another way of saying the, the Russians decide to exercise some monopoly power. And we'll see what that does to the rest of the market. Uh, then a lot of the other experiments we're going to do are looking at some of these other technologies, high voltage direct current like I talked about, uh, coal gasification. And then uh, we're going to work with the Stanford people to develop a whole bunch of interesting political scenarios. We're also going to uh, Impinge, impose on the model and see what that does. Thank you very much. Peter, thank you. I'm sure we'd all like to get our hands on that model. Uh, looks very interesting. At this point, I'd like to invite the expert panel up. Uh, so Peter, Bruce, and John, if you could uh, join us up here uh, for a brief commentary on this, and then we'll have the other speakers uh, uh, come and join them for the question and answer uh, after they are done. Right. Well, good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I've been asked to go first, and uh, I'm operating under strict instructions because uh, I was asked verbally and then uh, with a follow-up by email indicating it was actually serious to keep my comments well below eight minutes. So I will uh, attempt to do so, and as a result of which I have no graphics to show you. I was asked to comment on a couple of, couple of uh, issues. Firstly, you've heard a lot about the need for stable uh, legal and regulatory frameworks uh, to, in, to uh, facilitate, promote, allow the uh, tremendous uh, investment in infrastructure that's going to be needed if the uh, great demand future for gas is, is going to be realized. And I was asked how quickly I thought that might happen. And then I was asked to, to make a few comments on the risks and opportunities in, in power and uh, for gas as power. So I'll start firstly with the legal and regulatory. How quickly are the right conditions being put in place to our infrastructure will to take place. The answer is, of course, that if they're easy, it's not quickly enough. Um, now, there's a huge challenge here which should not be underestimated because uh, uh, we are in the process, and many speakers have made this point, I think, we are in the process essentially of a transition from one industry model to another industry model. Uh, the old industry model is the one most of us are very familiar with, which is the, uh, uh, the structure based on long-term take-or-pay contracts on the one hand, monopolistic franchises, by buyers with captive markets, uh, which therefore enable them to, to enter into these take-or-pay contracts as buyers on the other hand. And those, uh, that contractual structure of the industry was uh, basically the underpinning for a lot of the investment that's taken place and therefore allowed a lot of the infrastructure to be financed on a project finance, uh, semi-non-recourse basis. Of course, that model is uh, effectively uh, on the way out and being replaced over time by the new industry model which is the more competitive, uh, competitive uh, liquid, fungible market model. And the issue there, of course, the big issue, which has been raised by many, is what, therefore, will uh, sort of underpin the investments that need to be made if the old underpinnings have, dis have disappeared. The answer is sort of uh, our frameworks, legal and regulatory frameworks, which inspire the confidence to invest. Because at the end of the day, the, uh, the substitute for the long-term take-or-pay contracts is called rapid market growth, is called market uh, volume, market fungibility. And if that market growth and confidence in that market growth is there, people, by and large, will invest to bring their hydrocarbons to market. But to make that investment, of course, you do need these stable legal and regulatory frameworks. And therefore, that is the challenge. And what we're looking at, uh, whilst those frameworks are put in place to allow the investment, is, is potentially a, a, a hiatus period where people don't have the confidence in the newer model, uh, don't have the confidence in the old model because that uh, seemed to be on the way out, and therefore infrastructure build does not take place. So there's a big challenge here. 
And the challenge is to put those frameworks in place as soon as possible. The, the, there is a sort of virtuous circle you can, you can refer to, you can identify here, uh, which is all about another sort of issue raised several times this morning, risk and reward. Because if those frameworks are put in place to the satisfaction of investors, then essentially that will mean that people's perception of risk is lower. Now, if people's perception of risk as investors is lower, they will seek lower reward. That is the risk-reward trade-off. And lower, lower reward aspirations, by and large, of course, means lower cost. And that's lower cost for, uh, to be netted off the net back to the producers, and it's lower cost for consumers in terms of the delivered prices. So that is the virtuous circle that we're looking for, basically, is that confidence. And I referred earlier this morning to the climate of confidence. And this is, I'm down to two minutes already. I haven't started. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was warned. I can't complain. Okay. Well, so, I mean, I, I will sort of basically restrict my comments on legal and regulatory frameworks to that and move quickly on to power because in terms of the confidence for people to invest, the confidence of, uh, mature, of markets and growing markets, as you've heard again and again, a lot of that demand growth will come from the power sector or is forecast to come from the power sector. Now, uh, I think I sounded a warning this morning, which I'll repeat now. This is not a given. And we look in a few places and we see that actually this is not happening. I mean, let me take one case in point, Germany. Germany has been mentioned. Now, as of today, it may surprise many of you in the room to find out that Germany, does, as of today, does not have one single combined cycle gas turbine in operation, which is an interesting fact in itself. Why? Because the gas supply is not being made available to the power sector on the right terms and conditions. Uh, this is all to do with uh, indexation, oil indexation, and the recent rise in uh, oil prices has, of course, effectively priced uh, gas out of the power market, and therefore that, mar that market growth, that latent demand, is not being realized. Uh, going forward, if, uh, if we think, consider that two-thirds of demand growth is going to derive from the power sector, then clearly that is going to have a fund Im fundamental impact on, on the value of gas. And I think as an industry, one thing we do need to understand much, much further as a, a function of fundamental power market economics is what is the fundamental value for gas as power. And if gas is to be sold as power, what, what are the mechanisms for ensuring that the maximum value is retained by the resource owner and the supplier? If the, if the, if the uh, value proposition is a sale of uh, electrons, then how do you ensure, how do you minimize the cost of converting gas into electrons to maximize the net back to the supplier? I think I'm out of time, so I will stop there. I was, uh, I was not asked to keep it to eight. I was told 15. <laughs> but if you, if you want eight, you get eight. Uh, I'm Bruce Kiley. Uh, when I was asked to talk here, the question was, what kind of contribution could I make? And I thought that I would talk about the importance of the U.S. streamlining the LNG terminal permitting process, because that could be the big roadblock to preventing LNG's full potential in the United States. So I prepared this last week, and then I listened to His Excellency this morning. I listened to the, uh, uh, Secretary Baker and virtually every speaker, and everybody says one of the real problems in the United States is the permitting process. I think it's important if we're going to try to fix that process, if we're going to try to improve the potential of LNG in America, we need to know a little bit about where this problem began, where it is now, and perhaps give you some suggestions on how we can improve the process. There's no doubt that the U.S. policy today is pro-LNG. You heard it from, uh, you've heard it from uh, Alan Greenspan, you heard it from Secretary Abraham, the NPC report deals with it. USA Today a couple days ago uh, even had an editorial in favor of LNG terminals. So what's the problem? How come there are only four terminals today? That's a little, I don't know why it's cloudy. But the, you, there, out of all those dots there, those are all the proposed terminals but four. Four are in operation today. One in the Gulf Coast, one off of Georgia, one in the Chesapeake Bay, one in Boston. And the rest of those are all proposed. FERC has approved one, the Cameron in Louisiana. Uh, Port Pelican offshore is almost approved. Freeport in Texas is getting fairly close. But here we have the potential, people say, 8 to 10 by 2010, but the permits aren't being issued. And I think supplying co countries such as Algeria are nervous about whether the U.S. will be in a position to receive LNG. Qatar ought to be a little nervous about whether they're going to be in a position to receive LNG. We have ExxonMobil with a big 
project, ConocoPhillips for the big project, and will in fact the terminals be in place in time to receive that supply? Thinking at it from the standpoint of uh, Americans, are the LNG terminals going to be in place in time to be a meaningful contribution to the overall natural gas mix? I come at this a little bit from a perspective of a lawyer. I represent a project in New England. It's been on file for over a year, and it gets opposition after opposition after opposition. And if that opposition succeeds, there's going to be a problem. If the, op if the opposition is not successful, FERC can see fit to issuing a certificate, that will start to put confidence in the LNG industry, industry overall that maybe LNG is doable in America. The dynamics of onshore regulation are interesting. FERC used to have an open access policy. They used to treat LNG terminals as if they were pipelines. And as you heard this morning from various speakers who are the suppliers, the major producers, they're not interested in building a terminal, incurring the capital cost, if they're not sure they can use it for their own LNG. That was an impediment to a lot of projects. The four projects built today are on the old pipeline cost of service open access model. The new ones are on a new model right now. They don't have to be, but they're on the model where you can, you can apply for a permit. If you get the license to build it, you can use it 100 percent for yourself, or if you choose, you can share it with others. That was a big breakthrough, and that got a lot of people interested. But what is the difference between the old model and the new? The old is a kind of a tolling model, like Cove Point. The Cove Point owners don't own LNG. They just own the terminal, and the various users pay a fee. Same thing was true at Elba Island, Lake Charles. The new terminals coming along are just part of the LNG value chain, and people want to keep the cost of those terminals down, as opposed to in the pipeline days when you want to build up rate base so you could earn a return. Under the new structure, 100 percent of the benefit of the terminal is for the owner, 100 percent of the risk of the terminal is for the owner, part of the overall value chain. Now, the fact that, that FERC came up with a better proposal for projects is good, but it didn't change the fact that you need regulatory approvals, and that's where the problem starts. No matter what, you have to go through environmental review. And I think everybody in this room is happy to have environmental review. We want to make projects that are clean, do minimum damage to the environment. The problem with environmental review is it becomes a tool for delay and even a tool to block or thwart a project. The, from the FERC side, FERC does a pretty good job. They got a fairly good team. They just established a new LNG processing group. They tend to be the lead agency among the federal, the federal agencies, and they move at a pretty good pace. But the NEPA process takes time. And today, if FERC has that prior chart, if FERC has, I don't know why, the, some bulb must have burned out. But if FERC, if FERC has uh, 38 cases before it, it's going to take a while for them to work their way, way through that backlog. So the permitting process is important. But where are we finding the biggest challenge today is not so much on the federal side, but when you get to the states. Those of you in the room that remember the 1970s when there's natural gas shortage, oil prices were high, the, uh, the environmental groups were opposing infrastructure projects, NIMBYism was in full, full bloom. Now we're in 2004, we have high oil prices, we're starting to have a supply-demand imbalance on, on natural gas, we need infrastructure, we need LNG terminals, the environmentals are back and the NIMBYs are back in full force. And they're, they're, they're back and they're not worried about environmental issues nearly as much as they are about we do not want a project. One of the, one of the more difficult things that's happened recently is their zeal to block the projects is so strong that they've now created the specter of fear. Back in the 70s when LNG terminals are first being built in the U.S., they worried about the storage tank. And, and people who really worried about the storage tank kind of got debunked over time because there were safety mechanisms in place. Since 9-11, since the USS Cole incidents like that, people are now raising the specter that an LNG vessel, when it's near land, near a community, perhaps uh, when it's offloading, will be hit by a terrorist attack of some sort. There will be a massive s spill of liquid on the water. The liquid will vaporize and it'll turn into a fire. And so, so that, and, and so that is a serious issue. Everybody wants a safe industry. 
Everybody wants to have an industry that if the customers are comfortable, the local community is comfortable, and the industry is comfortable. But this is a problem. FERC, a couple of weeks ago, issued a report called an ABS report, which purported to deal with this LNG vessel safety issue. And if you've read the report, if you're in the business, if you're in the shipping business, it probably gave you pause. And the industry will probably reply uh, strongly on this Friday as to the issues FERC has raised. So FERC means well, but in its own permitting process has created another hurdle where people have to start disproving uh, the safety issue all over again. And when I say disproving it, I think each project applicant is going to have to put on a major case demonstrating that its particular project and the unique features of that project can bring a vessel in in a safe and secure manner. Of course, a lot of that goes to the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard is going to have to become more involved in the FERC process. All LNG shippers know that you have to deal with the Coast Guard. You have letters of intent to operate. You'll have a Coast Guard protocol. But that's going to become increasingly important to this business if we're going to satisfy the communities that LNG can be delivered safely, can be offloaded safely, and does not present a threat to their community. One final word out of the processing uh, mess we're in is the most important thing I believe that the, the U.S. industry needs is for FERC to start issuing some approvals of projects, for MARAD and the Department of Transportation to start issuing some approvals of offshore projects so that the industry knows projects can get done in America, the, the supply starts to flow, the supplying countries and the, the major sponsors, the major oil companies know that LNG will be a viable source of supply in America. John? Thank you very much. Uh, I don't have any prepared comments or, uh, or slides. What I thought I would do is maybe uh, just uh, wrap up with a, a few comments on uh, some of the uh, 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 issues that were presented this morning and then also a few thoughts that I had uh, listening to the uh, uh, very intriguing remarks about this uh, modeling study that, are, that have been undertaken over the past two years. Uh, as an industry practitioner, uh, I have to point out that uh, uh, I'm uh, not often uh, found in, in a uh, academia-type uh, setting. Uh, I'm dealing more day-to-day -day on the challenges of uh, developing the regas. However, uh, uh, many of the uh, issues and, and some of the findings uh, are, are quite interesting uh, uh, to me nonetheless, particularly uh, with regard to, this, uh, to the issue of security of supply. Uh, uh, Bruce had just uh, highlighted uh, a few of the issues involved uh, around uh, Citing uh, uh, new regas uh, uh, facilities, those happen to be the uh, ones that are the opposition uh, uh, highlights uh, initially, uh, to safety, security, uh, uh, these types of things. Uh, one I think that uh, is going to uh, get more and more attention, however, as we do in fact uh, see these uh, facilities being uh, uh, certificated and built, uh, is going to be the question mark around the security supply, and people are going to look to the upstream and, and look at particularly at the host countries in terms of uh, how secure are these new supplies. Uh, the Americans, uh, North Americans in particular, have been used to uh, having domestically supplied uh, natural gas, and now uh, we're changing that uh, process to where uh, our gas will be a, a combination, although still the preponderance of the volumes will be coming uh, from North American production. Uh, the, the consequence of having to import uh, natural gas is going to uh, be a new one, and as, as was pointed out earlier, uh, something new is always going to uh, catch the attention and it'd be hard for people to accept. Uh, uh, second point, uh, I, 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 I'm intrigued by the work being done uh, under this new study. As, as Bob uh, knows well, uh, uh, I was involved, uh, I was the head of the uh, LNG subgroup for the uh, NPC study, and one of the things we did not have either a mandate or the resources to do was exactly this type of work, to look at the upstream and to look at some of these consequences of, of international supply, and I, I, I think this is uh, much needed work, and, and uh, I'm glad to see that uh, uh, many of the uh, results that are being hinted at in, in, in terms of the presentations uh, are actually falling in line with some of our assumptions that we made uh, in, in terms of that study, assuming that the volumes were going to be there, that the markets would act rationally, and that North America would, would be a preferential uh, uh, destination for, for many of these supplies. So uh, that, that was also of uh, keen 
uh, interest to me. Uh, long term, the underpinning of, of these projects uh, through long term uh, contracts, I think uh, we keep hearing uh, again and again that that's uh, a, a theme that uh, uh, we've heard throughout the morning. Uh, I, I think that uh, we are on the verge of seeing a, uh, some dramatic changes in the industry. People have talked about these swaps and being able to uh, uh, ring out more efficiencies uh, in the system, and surely there, there, there are uh, uh, many of those that, that yet to be remain uh, to, to be uh, enacted. And so therefore, I, I think as, as we talk about these swaps and talk about these activities, uh, they're coming. Uh, I see them uh, day to day uh, in, in activities going on uh, as we speak uh, from the commercial side. They are, however, more difficult than, than people might believe uh, 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 having, a, having to do a swap, having to uh, gain the, uh, co get the commercial uh, frameworks uh, in place uh, legally, uh, re uh, regulatorily, uh, uh, agreements from uh, the host countries, uh, uh, and, and even the participants themselves to become comfortable with their counterparties uh, uh, is all taking some time, but it's, it's coming. And so uh, we, uh, we certainly don't see that uh, uh, short-term or speculative projects uh, uh, are, are going to be built uh, because of the uh, magnitude of the, of the regas and, and the full chain uh, uh, that's involved. However, uh, we, we see more efficiencies coming uh, throughout this, uh, the, the process. So those are the, uh, some of the key points that, that I've uh, t taken note of this morning, and uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm very pleased with what I'm hearing, and uh, I'm glad to see that uh, much of this work is, is going forward. Thank you. John. Could we have our three speakers up here? I've been asked to ask you to ask questions to move to one of the microphones, and we'll try to introduce, say your name and your affiliation. Uh, and if you want to direct your question towards a specific panelist, if you could so indicate that as well. So we have uh, 25 minutes or so for questions. Uh, does anybody want to start? Sir. From the World Bank. Uh, my question is directed to David, David Richter. You mentioned uh, the case of uh, Gazprom as uh, targeting essentially the German market. Uh, you do know also that uh, rural gas did buy 5% of uh, Gazprom. So how do you explain that? That's the first question. The second question concerning the transit countries I think is perhaps missing a point. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, many of these countries were faced by Gazprom to pay the price that the Germans were paying. And with the, an economy that has collapsed, they turned around and they said, can we also get the same transit fees as the others? And this is where, the, you know, the whole thing uh, started turning sour. And uh, last but not least, I think uh, Gazprom has also targeted, uh, like uh, Soyuz Gas Export before it, the French market, the Italian market, and the, uh, uh, the Spanish market eventually, uh, and the Austrian market. Have you mentioned that in your model, and is, is it taking into account, you know, those dynamics too? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me just take the, try to take them in, in reverse order. The, this particular project was first and foremost focused on the German market because of both the size of the German market and because of capacity constraints into northeastern Germany and because of the routing of this pipeline allows you direct access there. There's a part of the story that I didn't talk about here that is in the paper which, in which Treuhand is, is um, managing the sale of the distribution companies <coughs> in East Germany as well. And so that's going on at the same time. And you have the same players that Gazprom is trying to work with, in this case, get around Ruhrgas. Those same players are trying to take stakes. And they actually together end up taking a joint stake in the same company in East Germany. And I think that helps answer your question about so it seems kind of bizarre that Gazprom then takes a, the, the largest foreign stake of ga uh, uh, Ruhr gas. Maybe that wasn't, maybe that was Freudian. Uh, Ruhr gas takes <laughs> the largest uh, foreign stake of Gazprom. And the only uh, non-Russian member of the Gazprom's board is the head of Ruhr gas, now part of E.ON. Um, I think along the way that because the German government was highly ambivalent during this period about whether they really wanted this kind of restructured gas market. And that's why we never really saw any clear policy signal from the German government as to whether this was a good thing or a bad thing. If the German government had really wanted this, 
than I think you would have seen, uh, for example, prohibitions on cross holdings in the East German distribution companies. And instead, what happened is you had all the same players who were nominally competing actually owning part stakes in the same companies in East Germany. Um, and that helps understand then Ruhrgas's interest in taking this stake in Gazprom. What I see going on here is a kind of reintegration uh, uh, of this industry along lines that are formally possibly in compliance with the European concepts of competition, but in reality allow information to flow in ways that I think are going to be very, very hard for competition authorities to, to, uh, to address. And then you had another very important point which I'd completely forgotten. Uh, the expansion of the countries. market. Yeah. Into um, the transit country story is, is very complex here because these are not countries that are just sitting there with gas flowing across. They're also enormous, uh, enormous users. And the Ukrainians are, I believe, even using more gas than is ultimately transit leaving the country as, uh, as export. We document this in, in some more detail in the paper. Uh, the outcome of the transit country negotiations largely reflects the, the relative uh, uh, power and influence of these countries. So we, we don't argue that the transit country question here is totally irrelevant. Uh, for example, when, when uh, uh, the Russian government and Gazprom settled the matter with, uh, largely settled the matter in the middle 1990s with Ukraine, it was settled along lines that were, I think, uh, very favorable to Ukrainian interests uh, because they were still nonetheless in a, very, in a very strong position. But we wanted to underscore in the paper that the contestability of these markets over the long term is what's really important. Because of the lumpy nature of these projects, the, if you blow it, as it were, and it results in forcing another project that allows substantial bypass, then you're going to live with the consequences of that for a long period of time. And the same issue is going to come up tomorrow morning when Mark Hayes uh, speaks about the Transmed project, which exports gas from, from Algeria to Italy. Next, yes. Uh, David Pruner, Wood McKinsey. Wanted to ask you all, we've seen a lot of interest from the LNG suppliers who are trying to determine whether or not this LNG swap market is going to develop and kind of if so, when. We're also seeing, though, people that are not in the LNG game but are very well capitalized, uh, rather large entities that are looking to try to participate as a middleman in potentially LNG swaps. So the two-part question is, when might a market develop kind of timing-wise? And do you all see a role for a large credit-worthy counterparty, third party, to come in and fulfill some of the swap activity? Um, one of the dreams of LNG is to get these swaps. And the reason why they didn't develop uh, earlier on is that uh, there were these mono trades, and LNG ships did not cross in the night. So there was no logical swap. Um, now, with uh, literally contracts, if not ships, crossing in the night, uh, something I'm going to talk about tomorrow, um, th the swaps are now finally being done, though I'd agree with John that they're, be they're very uh, uh, complex. And as to the question about the middlemen, um, if you call Shell and BP uh, middlemen, then, then perhaps. But I re it reminds me of... Uh, of when the, the middlemen tried to establish themselves in the UK in the beginning and went to uh, the producers. And one of my friends at BP said, why do we need you? We can place it ourselves, which they did. Um, so I would argue that in LNG so far for a long time that to play a role, you need to be anchored somewhere. You need to either be a producer or a major buyer and have an interest other than being a middleman. Otherwise, I don't actually think you can make a strong case that you bring commercial value to the value chain. Indeed, you add cost and probably complexity. And as far as I and most of the people in LNG are concerned, there's already enough complexity without voluntarily adding more. Peter Hughes or John, you want to take a shot at that? Sure. I mean, I certainly agree with that. I just add to that that, I mean, we, we sort of consider that the uh, LNG business as it develops will over time develop along the lines of the oil business, but because of the particular character, characteristics of gas and LNG in particular, it is unlikely to reach the same degree of fungibility. Uh, what we do expect is a far more integrated structure of the gas value chain. We think the, the rewards and risks uh, will best be managed uh, by virtue of an inter as a function of an integrated approach to this market. 
in terms of the, uh, the ability to derive uh, benefit from sort of uh, arbitrage and sort of uh, seasonal, seasonal variations and price variations, I mean, I think uh, our, our view certainly is that the best way to do that will, free, will be through a, a, a portfolio of advantaged supply positions and market access positions, which will enable that, to, that, that arbitrage to be realized. I think the scope for middlemen to come into this market will be fairly limited for some, some time to come. I just uh, would like to add one other point uh, uh, that was brought out uh, during the morning discussions as well uh, regarding risk of uh, downstream market and uh, the fact that uh, uh, many of these large players are in fact taking the uh, risk of uh, being able to uh, make the gas go away from the regas terminal uh, into the U.S. market. People uh, uh, often talk on a conceptual level that it's a very deep and uh, uh, liquid market. However, uh, uh, you still have to uh, underpin those with contracts and the ability to move that gas away. And one of the uh, elements here, not only uh, do you have the contractual concerns upstream and with the shipping uh, that have to be taken into consideration and, and built into the system, but also the, the fact that uh, if, if you're diverting supplies and something happens in that diversion and, and being able to play in that game, you have to be able to cover those long positions that you might have in, in the downstream market as well. So the, these are all things that uh, uh, tend to uh, indicate that uh, you have to be a large player and a middleman and uh, role is uh, uh, going to be uh, long in coming. I just want to reinforce what uh, Amy said this morning. This is quite profound that you have people here talking about how and when rather than if uh, this is going to be done. One other comment I, I would like to make on that is that I think uh, we can learn something from electricity markets as well, that uh, a lot of the deregulated electricity markets now, um, it, you know, about 85% maybe of electricity is sold on long-term contract, but there's a very active market and contract for differences, um, and uh, it's situations where uh, governments have tried to force a lot of spot trading, we've gotten into trouble, and, and on the other hand, uh, are situations where you require uh, you know, uh, the vast majority, much bigger than 85% of electricity to be traded on long-term contract, there's also a problem, and uh, you leave it up to market participants, they seem to, to go for about 85%. With about 15% uh, left left uncovered in terms of long-term contracts or contracts for differences, and the other lesson from that is these is that the organised uh, exchange markets can actually facilitate a lot of this risk trading. So Thank you, you have that well-developed options and futures markets based on. I think that's one advantage of having uh, LNG being traded into to the United States and possibly also Europe, where you have you have more developed gas markets. Thank you, Peter. Next question. Um, hi, uh, John Beers with Dow Jones Newswires. Um, we've seen some recent um, indications about renewed interest in both nuclear and coal. Um, and I'm just wondering how you see that, if that's um, seen as sort of a hypothetical, if gas doesn't work out, or, or what, how we should read that, um, especially in light of the uncertainty around LNG permitting in the U.S. I want to go ahead, uh, David. Well, I mean, this is a huge question, and, and so uh, I'm sure others are going to want to say something about this as well. I don't think this is just hypothetical. I mean, the pre-approval of a few designs by NRC for, on the nuclear front, along with the possibility of, of even announcements within the next few years, siting issues are not trivial in the case of a nuclear power plant, but uh, the siting issues are not trivial, trivial in the case of regasification facilities. And there's an enormous danger that this LNG business is going to become, at least in terms of siting, like the new nuclear power, that the industry won't have paid enough attention to this problem. Uh, and it's very important to go back and look at what the industry in nuclear did, especially in the aftermath of Chernobyl. The, the Nuclear Operators Association, the effort to disseminate best practices, because an incident anywhere in the world is a will have a contagion effect everywhere in the world. And you can, engineers are always telling you it's safe and, you know, I'll drink the stuff or whatever they're saying. And that's all, I'm sure, true, but it's also almost totally irrelevant. Uh, the fact that a gasoline truck driving through your neighborhood is a lot more dangerous just doesn't matter in terms of the, the real problems on the ground in terms of siting. This is a public relations, a genuine public relations problem. Let me just say a word about carbon. Um, we tend to forget that here in this country because we don't really have a climate policy. But this is not an irrelevant issue, the climate change problem. And, and um, it's unclear, though, how carbon works out. Because you'd think that if you're 
if you expect, as I think most people in the industry do, that there's going to be a limitation on carbon dioxide in the, in the not um, uh, irrelevant future, so in the time horizons that these plants are going to operate, you'd think that folks would be wary of siting a coal-fired power plant. But the reality of how carbon is probably going to be addressed in this country, as is happening right now in Europe, is it's going to happen probably through an emissions trading system in which the allocation of the permits probably will follow more or less the status quo. So it's not actually a terrible strategy to have a big carbon emitting facility sitting there if you think that there's going to be an allocation of carbon permits sometime in the, in the future because it gives you a baseline from which permits worth billions, tens of billions of dollars. It will be the largest single creation of property since the opening of the American West when we allocate these emission permits. That could be a big deal, and I think that's part of the reason why you don't see as much aversion to new coal plants uh, in light of the climate change problem as you might you might expect. There's a lot of other elements to that story, but I'll be quiet. And others want, I'm sure will want to comment. Anybody else want to take a shot at that? Uh, in a lot of our work, we, we've uh, um, argued that uh, work on the basis that we think uh, integrated gasification of coal is, uh, is an alternative to gas, at least in the short term. In the longer term, uh, you know, we've been looking at uh, solar strategies. We've done, been done doing a lot of work looking at uh, solar cells. And we, the other thing I mentioned in my uh, talk was uh, high voltage direct current transmission. Uh, we've been working with the nanotechnology people here at RICE. They're very interested. They, they think that uh, there are a lot of uh, opportunities for using nanotechnology uh, a, for improving uh, solar cell efficiency, and I noticed uh, there was a news item about a week ago that uh, some nanotechnology developments uh, look like they can double the efficiency of solar cells. But uh, also, uh, the nanotechnology people think there's a, there are a lot of opportunities for using uh, uh, new materials uh, to uh, greatly uh, improve uh, high voltage direct current transmission. Um, uh, that uh, could involve uh, decreasing uh, resistance of the wires, but uh, can also involve making them uh, stronger and lighter, which also uh, greatly reduces the cost. If you can reduce the, the amount of uh, land is a very important expense in putting in those links. So uh, that's another, another way that you can get a lot more efficiency out of the electricity system, uh, and it also uh, would advantage uh, sort of solar plants if you could put them in a place like Arizona where land is cheap and then transmit the power at low cost. Uh, so slightly longer term uh, is another alternative to, to gas. A couple other quick comments on that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that you, there, there's your political and your technical answer. I'd just like to give a, a commercial gas answer, which is, first of all, um, what gas has to do about coal is keep its price lower. Um, and if it can keep its price lower, people are not going to cite the coal plants because the confidence in emission trading uh, it remains theoretical, though I agree with the theory, it just remains theoretical. The second thing um, is that uh, the logical thing to do about the inefficiency of the electricity system, in my view, long before you get that technology, is to do distributed energy. Because right now, with existing technology, gas pipelines are a far more efficient way to move uh, energy than high voltage lines. And so the gas uh, should be uh, generating power right in our houses or in our industrial sites. And if the gas industry were more attuned to that commercial opportunity and a lot slower uh, and less slow to adapt to it, then I think that uh, that would be, that's a, a more logical evolutionary step um, towards the uh, efficiency. And both of those are possible technically, but uh, seem to be beyond the commercial uh, innovation of the industry. Peter Hughes. I was going to make a similar point on, on economics because, I mean, this is, this is the, the nub of the issue. And if you look at the United States today, I mean, the United States has added since 2000, I think, about uh, 220,000 megawatts of new uh, gas, gas turbine capacity, mainly combined cycle gas turbine capacity since 2003. A lot of that capacity today is not firing. And I think an average utilization rate for all that capacity is about 30% whereas the basis on which that investment was made was that it would fire about 70% of base load. Why? Because the price of gas is simply too high. It is not competitive in the dispatch curve, and it is not dispatching. As such, it's a, been an economic catastrophe for the investors. Uh, what is going to resolve this? What is going to bring the gas price down to a level which allows that, that capacity to come back on stream? The, the answer is LNG. The answer is LNG. <laughs> Without large quantities of LNG coming down into the U.S. market, the U.S. market will clear because markets are efficient, the market will clear. 
it will clear at a lower demand level, a lower volume, and a higher price. And that lower demand level will not include not much gas-fired capacity. And if the higher price is maintained because LNG doesn't find access to this market, then the next generation of power generation capacity will, will be coal or will be nuclear because of fundamental economics. And when that capacity comes on stream, because of its very low marginal cost dispatch uh, characteristics, it'll actually force gas, what gas-fired capacity is dispatching back down merit order. So there will be less demand for gas. So we had a lot of talk today about demand growth for gas, particularly in the US. There is actually a scenario which says, which I, I alluded to this morning, which actually is of no demand growth and even demand decline in this market. Yeah, just one comment on that too, which is at the end of the, the forecast horizon and the, the sort of model that, that I spoke about, prices we're getting toward the end of that period would bring on coal gasification. So uh, even there where you have all of the, the natural gas being developed and so forth and LNG coming in, uh, still toward the end of that, that horizon, uh, there are these alternative, uh, alternatives out there that are going to be very competitive with gas. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Uh, Alex Farrell, UC Berkeley. And this question is really for Mr. Bladley and Mr. Hughes. Um, but it reflects some of the discussion that's just been going on. And the, the real issue, I think, is that the infrastructure needs for the energy systems that we have uh, a need for in the future are, are quite dramatic. And the question really is, what do we need to do in changing the processes by which we come up with the schemes for these infrastructures? And so, for instance, the nuclear option that David mentioned, um, if you pay attention to the nuclear industry, as I, I pay a little bit of attention to, they're really worried about what happens after Yucca Mountain. Yucca Mountain is approximately sized for the waste for once through reactor fleet that we have today, and it's difficult for investors to think, investors anyway, maybe not DOE, to think about a new nuclear power plant fleet without a new Yucca Mountain. Imagine that problem. And so this question of trust, I think, Mr. Hughes, is really quite interesting. You brought it up in, a, in multiple dimensions, not just the trust that either exists or doesn't exist between the enviros and the developers, but the trust on, uh, and not just between the uh, investors and, and the uh, producing countries, but also the fair trade issue. And so I'm wondering, the, Mr. Bliley, the process that you sort of described, I may be mishearing it, does sound a little bit like um, we come in with a development project, we argue about it, we go to the formal legal processes, FERC or whatever. I might be wrong about how I'm hearing that, but are the processes that we have set up today, and it might not just be on regasification terminals, really feasible for solving these siting problems where citizens don't want many of these infrastructures near them at all. The, the process right now, it's possible that it'll work. The, 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 big, the biggest problem I think you're seeing is you do have the local opposition that truly is a not in my backyard. They're, they're, not, they're not thinking about the alternative to shutting down an LNG terminal that you might have a nuclear plant. They're not thinking that there won't be another Yucca Mountain. They're thinking they don't want it in their backyard, and it doesn't matter what the economic benefit would be. It doesn't matter that it would or would not have any adverse impact on the community. They just want to shut it down. The solution is, I think, under the current statutory framework, is FERC has to keep, to, to the extent it's an onshore terminal, FERC has to keep pushing ahead, exercising the full extent of its jurisdiction, and start issuing some permits so there's a sense of confidence. We have one or two new terminals built. They work. There's plenty of mitigation measures with the Coast Guard and others to keep the safety factor under control. And if you have that kind of momentum building, then I think there's a chance that you get to your seven or eight uh, terminals in the U.S. A problem you have, though, life is never simple. The state of California is, is challenging today whether FERC has the jurisdiction to authorize a, a terminal in California or not. If the, if, the U, if the courts decide that California has either an equal shot or a better shot at it than FERC, however many coastal states there are, you're going to have each one of those states deciding what the national energy policy is, not the federal government. If, if you have that, the only solution is legislation. Legislation has been introduced within the last two weeks, three weeks, I guess that would make clear that FERC is, is the lead agency for all LNG projects that has exclusive jurisdiction. It is the lead agency within the federal government, and it has to act within one year. And if any federal or state agency does anything that conflicts with FERC, FERC trumps them. I don't know that you have to go to that extreme if everybody were to start to cooperate, but if people don't cooperate, and the people building projects here can speak 
for this too but if people won't cooperate and be fair and approve the best projects i think you have to have legislation otherwise you get to the point the gas prices are high you get your coal plants and other things i mean i, I think the, the simple answer to your question is i mean the, the, it is down to an issue of trust i mean look at the fundamentals and it's worth repeating that the world is not short of gas the world has lots and lots of gas as of today, an RP ratio of 60, and most of that gas actually has been found for one good reason called accident by an industry looking for, looking for liquid hydrocarbons, which found gas by accident. So there's a lot of gas out there, a lot more to come. So that is not a fundamental constraint on, on a very smooth and, and uh, a fairly rapid development of, of the global gas business. It is all the other sort of institutional and structural issues that we've, we've uh, heard about, and they, those barriers have to be removed. And it is ultimately in the enlightened self-interest of the United States and other countries to remove those barriers, such as to allow gas to flow uh, in, in, the, in the manner I've referred to. If you saw, you saw the, cost of, the long-term cost of supply curves that were shown earlier, I mean, the only issue I would take with them is actually the, the, the increase in the latter part of the period, because I suspect that actually uh, underestimates the ability, the proven ability of our industry to secure ongoing cost reductions and to use technology and te te technology improvements to drive down the cost of supply. So there is plentiful supply out there and plentiful supply at a very reasonable cost, which if allowed to access market uh, will, be, will be forthcoming. The trust is, is all about, as I think I said earlier, I think trust, the key to trust is partnership, is cooperation, is producer, producer you know, supply demand cooperation. I think there's a huge role, uh, but then you, I would say that, wouldn't I, for companies like my own, for ExxonMobil, for Shell, for Chevtex, for ConocoPhillips, in, in that respect, in, uh, in terms of engaging in mutually advantageous partnerships to provide the, the finance, the technology, and the access to market for gas, particularly the access to market that's required uh, to grow the gas business. On the demand side, again, all, all I can do is repeat, we have a fundamental need to educate people, uh, to make them comfortable to develop that climate of comfort, uh, of comfort and confidence that this is not a dangerous business. There's plenty of gas out there, that there are lots of reliable suppliers and they can, they can trust in it and that the technology is, is proven and that the safety record of the industry is a very, very strong and solid one. Okay, we have two more questions max. So the two standing will be the last two. Go ahead, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Chris Ross with Charles River Associates. Um, one thing that puzzles me, um, David, I think you uh, brought up a, a very provocative point that you thought that uh, gas pipeline in Russia would be smaller, more bite-sized in the future. Um, how is Russia going to fulfill its position in your forecasts with bite-sized pi uh, pipelines and with a mon monopoly that is going to run out of money? Well, let me, let me have a brief answer and uh, then Peter may, may want to say something more. Uh, lots of bites. Uh, it's the big consumer. It's a big guy there. He can eat a lot. Um, so lots of bite size uh, projects. Uh, just remember that the earlier projects, which were state to state agreements, involved huge, huge slugs of gas. Um, and I don't think you're going to see any commercial operator interested in doing, doing projects on that scale. Now, there's, there's the early parts of Yamal are going to have to probably involve larger slugs than simple expansion of some of the existing fields, and all of that is, is, uh, is correct. The question of the future of the Russian gas exports and the gas system in Russia, I think, is one of the, the great and the crucially important questions in the world gas industry today. Um, they have, as everybody knows, a monopoly. Um, they put, I mean, this, the numbers are just staggering. They don't, they, they put Almost none of the huge amounts of associated gas actually end up in the pipeline network. You know, it's one story after another. I think we don't know what's going to happen with the future of, of Gazprom. Um, if I were sitting at Gazprom, I would want to keep control over that network because that's where the rents are, gonna, are, going to, are going to reside. But there are a lot of really interesting and important scenarios for possible reform. I think we just don't know uh, what, what that is, but there are a lot of good ideas uh, out there. A comment in terms of the, the, the model, I mean, we, first of all, uh, the pipelines that we have added in the model are added gradually, so capacity is incremented. But the second point I want to make is, is that, in, act, in fact, uh, one thing we want to do with the model to, to improve is, is improve the way we treat economies of scale in building pipes. So we do have some elements of economies of scale in there, but we need to do more work on that. So I think to answer that question, so you might want to say, okay, if, if, if 
we represent the economies of scale and building pipelines better than we currently do. Um, uh, and then the model says you should be building these huge pipes, but then uh, David says, well, that, that ain't going to happen, you know, politically. So then the, you're going to be forced to, to add uh, uh, more continual, add pro, uh, smaller pipes more continuously. It's going to raise costs and so on, but uh, it'll still happen. Now, one thing, one reason in the model where you get these these wiggles and so on is, as I was saying, that you you want to add capacity in discrete lumps because there's a fixed cost and then a marginal cost. Uh, I um, the phenomenon that you describe, David, is one that I that I used to call marker pen pipeliners. Uh, it's very easy to take your magic marker and write all over a world map. It's a lot more difficult to lay a pipeline. Mm -hmm. But the world has been plagued by uh, marker pen pipeliners as long as I've been involved in the gas business. And I've also noticed that they almost always get built in logical uh, small connections and filled in later. And I see uh, no reason why that won't keep, uh, that won't keep happening. We had an aberration uh, where the economic radius of gas was artificially enlarged during the period of the Soviet Union, but even that's economically logical because they could also force um, all those places it went to take large amounts of gas. So they were actually doing both the supply and demand. Um, so, uh, you know, I would argue that that wasn't entirely logical, uh, though, though th that they can no longer do that. They have lots of demand, but not much, sorry, lots of consumption, but not much demand in, in Russia. Uh, and um, the, the other thing is that one of the things to remember, uh, and it's one of the comments that uh, I made in discussion yesterday on the model, here is where LNG has a huge competitive advantage. Because as markets become more mature, they're going to be able to absorb smaller and smaller incremental amounts. And if your pipeline project depends on a 10 BCM launch or 15, and LNG can put in one little train and capture the market, an LNG will put in little eyedropper bits, and the garden hose uh, big pipeline will never get off the ground. In fact, it will stay a magic marker pipeline. Yes, I'm going to let Peter take a shot, and I'm going to have to apologize so that we don't push the next session. We'll just have to stop at this question. Uh, but uh, we'll make sure you can corner, get first dibs at these people when we break. So, Peter, why don't you close it out with your answer, and okay, we'll, we'll be on to the break. Very, very quickly, I just wanted, I think, reinforce the point about economic rationality, which will drive further capacity decisions. I mean, in the good old days, uh, the marker pen environment did exist, and you've seen actually some results of that marker pen environment. One of them is called the Blue Stream Pipeline, which is uh, across the Black Sea, which is a pipeline of 400 kilometers length, which cost uh, just over $3 billion and was driven by factors other than purely economic. I mean, going forward, uh, you've heard mention of Gazprom's desire or stated desire to build a new North Baltic pipeline. Now, this will be a new corridor. And what really costs money in terms of gas infrastructure is creating new corridors. So whereas you might hear Gazprom talk about it, what you will see them do in practice is almost certainly uh, compress and loop the existing corridors because those represent the, the most cost-effective manner, uh, way of increasing uh, capacity into a given market. Uh, it doesn't get, away, get around the, the transit country issues, which are still pressing ones for them. But if you wanted a negotiating lever with the transit qu uh, countries in question, you would, of course, uh, uh, want to promote the idea that a, a new pipeline skirting them would be in the offing. So, I'll stop. Thank you. Let's give a hand for a great session. Thank you. Back here, back here at 4 o'clock.